You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Questions for Corbett podcast here on The Corbett Report. I'm your host, as always, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and I am technically reporting, recording this on the last day of April. So we'll call this April's edition of the Q4C podcast. If this is your first time here, welcome. This is the podcast where you ask questions and I give some answers. And uh, as always, there are way, way, way too many questions for me to answer all of them. So if I do not answer your question in particular, please do not take it personally. In fact, if you've sent me an email or contacted me in some other way and I haven't gotten back to you, again, please don't take it personally. I cannot possibly get back to everyone. And it is an ever, ever present ongoing struggle against my inbox to even attempt to try to answer uh, even the most important and urgent and pressing emails. So with all of that in mind, once again, if you, uh, if you do not have your question answered, please ask it again and it'll go back into the mix for next month's edition of this series. As always, there are lots of ways to ask your question. Of course, the most simple and straightforward is to go to the contact form on CorbettReport.com and you can contact me by either leaving a textual message, an email if you will, or you can uh, record your own voice uh, in the SpeakPipe ap application and it will be a voice message that will be sent to me. Uh, of course, you can also record your own message in a video form and put it on YouTube or another video sharing platform of your choice. In fact, preferably not YouTube, but anyway. <laughs> and uh, you can also tweet your questions at me using the Q4C hashtag. That's Q, the, the number four and the C uh, for questions for Corbett. Uh, and of course, as always, Corbett Report members can log into the website and leave their comments in the, or questions in the comment section of this post on CorbettReport.com. Speaking of which, last month we had questions for Corbett number 34, and in that one uh, you might recall that there was the great Bitcoin giveaway. I was giving 0 0.1 Bitcoin away to any Corbett Report member who was asking for it, and that was a hugely popular <laughs> uh, thing, and, it, uh, and there were many, many people who took me up on it. Probably, I don't know, but probably a hundred or so people. Um, so I'm very glad to see a lot of people dipping their toe into the waters of Bitcoin, and at that point, I think Bitcoin was hovering around the thousand or eleven hundred dollar mark. Now it's at the thirteen hundred dollar mark, so you've just uh, gained a little bit uh, from your 0 0.1 Bitcoin if you've held on to it during in the intervening time. Interesting. And it's now an official currency here in Japan. It's uh, going to be used in more and more retail outlets. It's starting with a uh, big camera in Tokyo if you happen to be located there and uh, there are lots of moves afoot but <coughs> that being said <coughs> thank you again to all the participation from the Corporate Report members in the last edition of this series. Let's get to the comments and questions for this edition of the series and it has been a few months since we've concentrated and concentrated on Twitter so I thought we would start today with some Twitter questions, again, sent through the Q4C hashtag. The first one is from at 911 underscore truth now, who writes uh, simply, does seismic catalog of 9-11 exist? And uh, thank you for that question. Yes, the short answer is yes, a seismic catalog of 9-11 exists. The long answer to that question would involve uh, the records of the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University, which did record the seismic activity that was taking place that day. And of course, I'll link you to the data itself on the ldeo.columbia.edu website. And perhaps more importantly than the data itself is the interpretation of that data. And that data was interpreted by French geophysicist André Rousseau in his article, Were Explosives the Source of the Seismic Signals Emitted from New York on September 11th, 2001? Spoiler for those of you who haven't read the paper yet, the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, explosives were the cause. That was uh, published um, by the Journal of 9-11 Studies. And long-time hardcore Corbett Report listeners might remember my 2012 interview with Dr. Russo on that paper. And if you don't, well, you're in luck. I'll, of course, include the link to that as well as everything else we talk about here today in the show notes for this edition of the series. So you can go and listen to it. That was interview 567 for those of you keeping track at home. But to add balance here, I suppose, to this uh, conclusion that it was explosions that caused the seismic activity, we should note that the aforementioned LDEO of Columbia University 
acknowledged these anomalous readings in their 2016 write-up on the data, but they ascribed it to uh, dynamite blasting at a rock quarry in New Jersey. And they quote seismologist Wan Young Kim, who examined the data, as saying, quote, I was very surprised they were still doing it that day. I thought they would have stopped, but they continued, end quote. Very interesting. So the official story is, yes, there were anomalous seismic data readings from September 11, 2001 that are not accounted for by the plane impacts or the uh, destruction of the building. But don't worry, guys, it was dynamite blasting in New Jersey that was going on as all hell was breaking loose. So interesting. Take that for what you will. But that is an interesting and underexplored area, I would say, of the data that we have about what was going on on 9-11. So thank you for that question and the opportunity to at least raise that. Uh, let's switch over to at alt millennials, alt underscore millennials on Twitter, who writes, uh, James, we want to know what's on your bookshelf behind you. Can you go through and point out your favorites? Must haves. Q4C. Thanks. We love you. Well, thank you for that question, Alt Millennials, and I love you too, whoever you are. Um, yes, this is obviously a question that I get many times in many forms, and in fact, you might remember that I created an entire video a couple of years ago called A New World Order Reading List, where I went over and explained, first of all, that I, of course, have recommended at this point over the decade of the Corbett Report hundreds of different books, so I can't possibly go through them all. Um, if somebody at home ever wanted to make a list of all the books I've ever recommended, or at least the ones that they come across when they start making the list, that'll be interesting, and please do send it along. But obviously, if you continue to listen to the podcast, you will continue to constantly get more reading ideas. But uh, I did at that time in 2015, I think, make a, a video where I recommended a dozen or so books that I think were important and still would recommend, so I'll put the link into that video specifically um, in order to help you uh, come up with some ideas, but let's just go through uh, some of them that are on my bookshelf right now uh, that won't be surprising, again, if you listen to the podcast, because anything I really want to recommend to people uh, will obviously be talked about on the podcast in some form. For example, just a few days ago, of course, I just posted my interview with William Pepper about the plot to kill King. If you haven't listened to or watched that interview yet, please do so. I think it was a particularly powerful interview, as attested to by the comments that I've received on it so far, and about a very, very important book. If you don't know about the MLK assassination and the fact that it was not James Earl Ray who killed Martin Luther King Jr., and that the government absolutely 100% was involved, please do read this incredible book. Um, and I recently, of course, talked to Douglas Valentine about the Phoenix Program. Um, again, very foundational, important book about uh, an under-discussed aspect of the modern world and the intelligence agencies and how they shape our lives. Of course, I've talked to Larkin Rose a number of times. His book, The Most Dangerous Superstition, should be on everyone's reading list if they haven't read it yet. Uh, this is an interesting book that is, uh, well, I, very important for a long-term project that I'm working on that shall remain nameless, but this one's called Hidden History, The Secret Origins of the First World War. Some very interesting nuggets in here. This is by Jerry Doherty and Jim McGregor. And if anyone in the crowd happens to know these uh, gentlemen or how to specifically get in touch with them directly, please do pass on the word that I'm looking to talk to them and would love to have them on the program to talk about this book. I've never been able to get in touch with them directly, which is un unfortunate um, because I, it would make it for a very interesting conversation. And I think uh, a lot of people would be interested in the contents of this book. Uh, speaking of very interesting books that I would heartily recommend. I'm currently going through, so I guess I can't recommend it unreservedly at this point, but from the uh, first first third or fourth of the book, um, absolutely incredibly important book um, that I'm working on for another project, which shall remain nameless, but um, it's called War Against the Weak, uh, a Eugenics in America's Campaign to Create a Master Race. As you know, if you've listened to the Corbett Report for any length of time, eugenics is one of the core issues that I come back to over and over again because it's such a foundationally important lens for understanding so much of the uh, pathocracy, however else you want to define it, um, that has ruled the world for centuries, but certainly over the past century. This is such an important topic. And as much as I have researched on eugenics, uh, there's still 
mind-blowing information on pretty much every page of this volume. Um, just incredibly important. And the amount of research that went into this is itself mind-blowing. When you look at the way this information was compiled with a team of researchers that were going through indexing archives that most people don't even know exist all over the United States, all over the world, the uh, the footnotes in here are just for a researcher, are just incredibly valuable resource. So I couldn't recommend this one enough, War Against the Weak. Um, but it's not all <laughs> it's not all hard-hitting politics and doom and gloom all the time <laughs> in the Corbett household. Um, there are some books that I read for fun here and there. Uh, actually, yes, I should mention that I did a little subscriber video at the beginning of this year explaining to uh, listeners that I've realized over the last couple of years the vast majority of books that I've been reading have been on screens, on you know tablets, on devices of various forms, PDFs or EPUBs or even Kindle, can you imagine? Um, so I made a, a, a resolution, not a New Year's resolution, a resolution that coincided with New Year's, that this year I was not going to read e-books to the extent possible. I still sometimes have to do that, but to the extent possible I'm trying to read as more paper actual physical volumes, because it really does make a difference for reading retention as well as the physical experience and all of that. Um, even just the attention that you can give it when you don't have a million notifications and things going on on your device. So that has uh, changed my reading habits a bit, and in a good way, I think, because I now have a little more time for pleasure reading. So on that note, I... Uh I read this book recently, Joe's Speedboat, which was a book that was given to me as a gift after I gave, delivered my lecture in Groningen in the northern Netherlands back in, I think that was 2013, wasn't it? Uh, so a few years ago now, uh, I was given this as a gift by Dr. Andringa after my lecture, and I'm embarrassed to say that I have only just recently read it. And uh, although it's no... It's not mind-blowing. It's not the best book I've ever read in my life. And, you know, I'm not going out there on, on a limb or on, on the rooftop screaming about it. But it is, I mean, it's an enjoyable book. I really did enjoy it. So thank you, Dr. Andrea, for, for providing me this book. And I will uh, plug it here. It was, a, it was a good read. It was enjoyable. Nothing to do with politics or anything that we talk about here on the Corbett Report. But enjoyable nonetheless. Um, and I, I finally can get to some of this pleasure reading that I've had on my shelf for an embarrassingly long time, but I'm doing a million other things, so I don't have a lot of time for it. Um, a couple of other tidbits I'll let you in on. I'm getting more and more emails about this object again, which is interesting because, of course, you'll remember from questions for Corbett number 10 that uh, <laughs> uh, I answered, I already answered, what is this little object that's on the bookshelf behind you? So I'll put in the link to QFC number 10 and queue it up to the exact question where you can find out more about this if you're really interested. Uh, and you will have to get your hands on a copy of this little tome. This is College Green, the Literary Arts Journal of the Graduate Students Union of Trinity College Dublin, which I edited back in 2003. And they probably have it still kicking copies of this, kicking around at the Graduate Students Union at Trinity. So if you happen to be there, pick up a copy. I edited this. Um, that's a blast from the past. I hardly even remember those days, but there you go. And another tidbit for the collector who must have everything. You do not talk about Fight Club, which happens to have an essay about Fight Club by yours truly, James Corbett, included in here. So if you really, really want to read everything I've ever written, you'll have to... You'll have to get this, and you'll have to read this if you want to read what I edited back in back in the day anyways. So that's just some of what's kicking around my bookshelf, and uh, obviously we'll be going through more of it over the months and years as we go from here, but I just wanted to give you that uh, update since you asked for it. All right, thank you again for the question at Alt Millennials. Let's move on to the next Twitter question, again using the Q4C hashtag, at Neogratch writes, Hey James, are you getting prepared in case of a nuclear strike from North Korea that might actually happen in the near future? All right, thank you for the question. And yes, I suppose if there is a nuclear event on the Korean Peninsula, I'm going to have a front row seat here in Japan. And who knows, it might even be closer than that, because, of course, Japan would presumably be a military target of North Korea. Because, at the very least, um, for the numerous U.S. spaces and the very many, many U.S. Uh, service personnel that are stationed on these islands. So, yes, uh, that 
is at least a possibility and something that is, as you would imagine, very much in the news here. In fact, it is, of course, it's something that is being talked about at length here and being pumped certainly into the public consciousness by the media and by the government organs, as you might expect. I, I, I would say it's a different flavor than you would get from CNN or whatever you get in whatever your locality you're living in, but there is obviously the the paranoia, the fear and panic uh, spreading that's going on in the media here. And a good, interesting example of that uh, that I saw recently and I retweeted out on Twitter uh, was from Shingetsu News, which was passing on some documents that the Osaka city government is putting out these days about what to do if you're out and about in, you know, in the city and nu- in, and missiles, uh, missiles strike or missiles are coming or something like that. They, they don't actually specifically say, you know, nuke, nukes from North Korea, but, you know, obviously in the context, that's what it means. Or uh, what to do if you're at uh, at home and, you know, a missile strike is about to occur. Or what to, what to do if your child is at Kindergarten and a missile strike is about to occur. It's, and of course, illustrated with, you know, Japanese cartoons in the Japanese way. So, just, just ridiculous kind of fear mongering like that. Um, and also I noticed and retweeted on Twitter that, uh, a government document that in fact was originally published in 2006, um, about how, you know, it, what to do if Japan is invaded, basically. Uh, it's all in English, so you can go read it if you want. Um, it's a bizarre little document. It's been making the rounds, on Twitter at least, uh, once again. Uh, I'm not sure if it was reissued by the government or if there was some special link promoting it or something, but at any rate, it's been making the rounds again. So clearly it's in the zeitgeist right now talking about these issues. Uh, it is essentially a run, duck, and cover redux. If you look at the cartoon figures of what they want you to do, you know, basically just run for cover and duck and hide under a desk. Um, which, of course, is very reminiscent of the old Cold War propaganda, which itself was total PSYOP nonsense. And they knew that it was PSYOP nonsense. Run, duck, and cover doing absolutely nothing. Uh, we can take that from an article here. Remember, duck, and cover? What safety experts may have been thinking? Uh, which notes, uh, why did they continue on with what was clearly inadequate advice, i.e. the run, duck, and cover advice? Even then, safety experts were well aware that providing reassuring advice lessened the likelihood of panic. As we all know, heightened fear can be paralyzing, and this enhances the danger for the person and all those around him or her. The world witnessed this in action during 9-11. Maintaining calm and marching down what must have seemed like a dizzying endless series of stairs in the World Trade Center was life-saving. Uh, parenthetical aside, and, well, why were they being told to return to their desks and uh, not to? Uh, that, was, that was part of the let's not panic and cause a problem mentality that was going on on 9-11, and that resulted in a greater number of deaths. But anyway, uh, returning to the article, quote, in addition, studies during World War II showed that lightly trained, 48 hours or less, civilians could be organized into teams and perform 95% of the emergency services needed immediately following a catastrophe. It must have been with these thoughts in mind that the civil defense program continued despite experts' rapid realization that duck and cover would very likely be inadequate, end quote. So, in other words, it was known, even at that time, it was known that run, duck, and cover would do nothing for an actual nuclear blast with nuclear fallout. You're not going to hide from the nuclear fallout under your desk. It didn't save anyone in Hiroshima or Nagasaki. So uh, they knew it was ridiculous, nonsensical advice from that perspective, but, hey, it'll keep everyone calmer and more in line and more easily pliable and... Uh, they could be told what to do, you know, in the event of whatever happens, and we'll call it, you know, a nuclear strike, and everyone will fall in line. So it was about it was about operant conditioning, essentially, which I think is something that's going on in the Japanese population right now. Now, interestingly, let's contrast that the hype that's going on here in Japan about this to what's happening on the front lines, the real front lines of this, uh, South Korea, where obviously it's an even more imminent threat. And yet, in South Korea, the leading presidential candidate to replace the impeached, imprisoned, disgraced uh, Park Geun-hye, uh, Moon Jae-in of the Democratic Party, has vowed to revive the sunshine policy of reconciliation and engagement with the North. Uh, if you don't know about the sunshi- sunshine policy, I will throw in a helpful link uh, from Global Research where there's an article explaining the history of that and how the Bush administration deliberately derailed that uh, that policy in order to uh, stoke the tensions. Um, and, hey, mission accomplished, uh, axis of evil and all of that certainly didn't 
tamp everything down. It's not like everything's peachy keen because of that, that uh, what the Bush administration did, uh, which is probably the point. So anyway, all of that being said, the South Koreans, I think, are probably freaking out about this a lot less than Japanese are. And then again, having said that, there is a lot of hype, there is a lot of government propaganda and what have you floating around about missiles flying over our heads, but it's still not an not, you know, everyone is talking about it at the water cooler, or everyone's frightened about it here. I don't, I don't, at least no one I talk to is particularly, you know, fretting about this. Uh, it's, it's there, it's a possibility, but it's not something that people are freaking out about that I've seen. Um, although I have seen articles talking about people buying emergency supplies in Japan, but when you actually read the, de- the details of those articles, it's like specialty supply, like water filter shops that are for, you know, nuclear apocalypse or whatever, have, you know, eight sales this month, which is their highest ever. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, on a population of 125 million people or whatever it is, <laughs> you know, oh, wow, we have, we have 12 sales this month. It's amazing. <laughs> Um, so again, I, I think there's every side plays up the hype and and in, in this not just not just the government, not just the mass media, even the alt media. I think plays these things up um, sometimes. Um, so ultimately, I'm not exactly living every day in terror about the possibility of uh, this. And if it happens, hey, well, I guess I'll just be here providing you the first hand as it happens reports. Uh, let's move on to an audio question from the Speakpipe application. This one coming in from Rusty. Hello, James. My name is Rusty from Reno, Nevada. I wonder if you would like to make a comment about the ability for government forces to brainwash somebody into actually committing murder. I'd like to reference the Fort Lauderdale shooting in January of this year at the airport done by a veteran, Santiago. Uh, Three suspicious things make me alerted to this story. One, that it happened during President Trump's meeting with the CIA for the first time. Two, the person was a veteran seeking mental health care from the VA. And three, this person actually said that he tried to contact the FBI field office in Anchorage, claiming that the CIA was brainwashing him, hearing voices in his head to commit acts of violence. And then shortly after that was reported, the news story completely stopped. This is suspicious for me. My question is, is there any evidence to support that this is possible? Could a person be brainwashed into committing these kinds of acts as sort of a sleeper cell? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Rusty. Uh, Well, the short answer to your question is that, yes, they can do it. And um, I would recommend that you take a look at episode 220 of the Corporate Report podcast on the strange case of Sirhan Sirhan. Uh, which was recently made into a YouTube uh, vi- v- video for the Extras YouTube Extras channel by video editor Brock West. So thank you, Brock, for doing that. And he did a great job with it. But because it uses a bit of Darren Brown uh, from Channel 4 in the UK, Channel 4 did their copyright auto-detect thing. And uh, I think it is flagged, so I think it is not playable in the UK on YouTube. And... Oh, and or there's advertising slapped on it. Maybe both. I don't know. But at any rate, it might be difficult for you to watch the YouTube version of that if you desire to. So in that case, and hey, why not? In every case, why not go to BitChute, BitChute.com, where you can watch that video. I'll throw the link into the BitChute video. Or, of course, you can always go to CorbettReport.com, no matter what happens with any other site anywhere in the world. CorbettReport.com has the MP4 videos that you can download and or, or stream directly. Um, so... Just as a side note. But yes, the long story short is that um, mind control absolutely really does exist in the uh, capacity of being able to turn people into assassins. And again, this isn't... This isn't even the, you know, crazy alt-media conspiracy guys. This is Darren Brown on Channel 4, you know, doing what was supposedly, the you know, done to Sirhan Sirhan. And, you know, the trigger of the girl in the po- polka dot dress sending him into target ro- mode and all of that. Again, you'll have to listen to the episode to get the full context of that. But the short answer is yes, absolutely. Mind control assassins is a thing. It sounds incredible and unbelievable to people who are in total 
yeah, I want to say total mainstream land, but Darren Brown on Channel 4 is total mainstream land. So I guess uh, people who have been programmed into thinking that anything that sounds like that must be must be false. Well, it's not. So um, that's that's the, the 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 answer to your ultimate question there. As for the Fort Lauderdale shooting itself, I have done no research into that. So if there are people out there who have done research, please do leave that that in your in the comment section and. Tell us all about that. So I don't know in that particular case whether mind control was involved or not. See, this is the problem with a topic like this. I think it has to be on, you know, it has to be taken on a case-by-case basis, like everything else, because there really are mentally ill people who really do have paranoid fantasies, schizophrenic paranoid fantasies, so they've implanted something in my brain, blah, 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 you know, it's mind control. We can't just take every assertion of that at face value. Oh, well, he said it, therefore it's true. I mean... There are mentally ill people and and people trying to muddy the waters and whatever. I mean, you can think of a thousand different reasons why people would lie about that. So we can't take that as um, definitive evidence, but it might be something to at least look into. Um, so if anyone has done that in that particular case, please let us know about it. Uh, let's move on to the next question. This one from a Corbett Report uh, member on the in the comment section from Questions for Corbett 34. S.C. Pat writes, I know that you have identified with the life philosophy of voluntarism, where interaction between people is through voluntary participation. I would like to hear your defense of voluntarism in regards to law and order in a voluntary society. Undoubtedly, there will always be sick and violent people in the world who intend to cause harm to innocent people. Without police, who would stop any person or groups of people from violently extorting, abusing, or causing harm to innocent, defenseless people? Thank you very much for this question, S.C. Pat, because it addresses what I think is a fundamental misconception of voluntarism and free society that many, many, many people have. And I understand why, because most people have never even tried to think about what a free society is, let alone how it would be done. And I'm not saying that in a condescending way. I know that this is the first thing, including myself, a lot of people have when they first get into this. And they often start with that misconception that there would be no such thing as a police-type force or a police-type organization in a free society. In fact, there would be. More on that in a second, but firstly, I should uh, thank some of the uh, Corporate Report members who were doing some of the back and forth and answering the questions in the comment section. I love to see that. So Dan Man Ultra um, responds to SC Pat by pointing out that police don't really stop crime, usually. They generally investigate it after the fact if you're lucky. Um, and I'm sure everyone, including myself, has had some experience of having had a crime committed against them and the police not even, well, saying that, well, okay, we'll record it, but we can't do anything about it. Uh, in my case, I was parking at West Edmonton Mall because uh, when I was originally coming to Japan and I had to get my visa and there was a consulate in Edmonton or something like that, I'm a Calgarian, so I was in Edmonton, which is enemy territory, as it were, for Calgarians in the friendly, loving rivalry between Calgary and Edmonton. So I was there, and I was uh, parked in West Edmonton Mall's parking lot for a few hours, and when I came back, <laughs> my car had been smashed, the window had been smashed, broken into. Nothing was taken that I remember. I d there was really nothing in there, but they didn't try to take the stereo or anything like that. It, it was just, I think, random smashing of windows, I think. I don't remember anything being gone. Um, and I remember at that point thinking, well, what do I, what do, I do? Nothing's really missing. It's just a smashed out window. I mean, clearly it was done. It was intentional, but what, you know, I, I thought, well, do they have a camera or something? So I went to the parking lot attendant. They're like, eh, you know, we have a camera, but not on this particular spot. So we don't know. And I said, well, you know, what can we do? And he said, well, I can call the police. They can come take a report. So we did, waited for the police. They came, take, took the report and did absolutely nothing. And they said, well, okay, we'll take the details, but we're not going to investigate. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so that, I mean, I'm sure everyone in the crowd has some example of that where police not only don't stop the crime, they don't even investigate it. And it, we've talked about it on New World Next Week of entire towns saying, where the police chief or the uh, sheriff is saying, you know what, you guys better defend yourselves because we can't do it for you. Um, craziness like that. Uh, that's one point to be made. Another point, uh, Tyler.c opines, uh, I would love to pay to have a security force for my area where if I wanted to, I could have a security employee fired for doing their job incorrectly or abusing their position in the community. What an incredibly important point 
because we know that we live in a world of absolutely insane police abuse and violence that is inflicted on the public with essentially nothing that can be done about it. Um, people can get angry about it. People can even protest about it. But ultimately, it does not change the fundamental fact that at the very best, the most you can hope for is that some police officer is going to get paid leave while they get investigated and then ultimately, inevitably exonerated by the police department for their abuse. And we do not have to you know, dig through mountains of, uh, of news stories to find this. It is literally raining from the skies every single day. Just from this week alone, here are some of the headlines along those lines. Cop charged for punching elderly bathroom attendant because the water was too cold. Uh, man beaten by cop in viral jaywalking video. Beaten again, stripped naked, and mocked by cops. Uh, cop who broke elderly vet's ribs caught on video again, attacking innocent grandpa. And, oh, my favorite, I guess, from the, uh, the past week. Cops detain an entire school, illegally search and grope 900 kids, find nothing, parents furious. Oh, wow, what a, you know, what a wonderful, perfect situation. And what a horrible thing to imagine a free society where, you know, oh, it would, it would be total chaos if we had a free society, right? Um, so, uh, I understand. People think, oh, freedom, terrible freedom, and there won't be a police force, so it will be total chaos, right? I mean, yeah, we have a police force, but and they're, they're abusive and corrupt, and there's nothing you can do about it, but, you know, they more or less keep the worst at bay. Um, but th- that, as I say, is a fundamental misconception. The idea that a free society would not have some policing entities is fundamentally a misconception. In fact, you're right, it wouldn't have a single, unitary, monopolistic police force that, that cannot be questioned, cannot be overturned, cannot be defunded, cannot be in any way uh, disengaged with or opposed um, without being beaten down violently. Um, it would have numerous services that would have to compete for customers and which would, could be fired when, if, as they abuse their power. Another common but incorrect assumption is that if there were no ruling class or no government, people would have no way of defending themselves against common criminals or foreign invaders. Again, this is simply not true. The government version of protection is inherently hypocritical. Governments will use their hired law enforcers to find and lock up some of the private thugs and thieves and prevent them from preying on people. But every ruling class gets the money for its operations by way of taxation, demanding money from its subjects and punishing those who don't pay up. Oddly, every ruling class insists that it needs to be able to forcibly control and extort money from people in this way in order to protect them from private criminals who might try to forcibly control and extort them. In contrast, if there is no government, people do not lose their inherent right to defend themselves from violence or to defend what they have from those who would take it. Every person has this right, and they also have the right to organize and cooperate with each other to exercise that right. Organizing for mutual defense does not require any government-granted laws or authority. No one wants to be attacked or defrauded, and everyone wants to feel safe. Whether each person takes this on himself or herself individually, or whether they hire and organize others to do it on their behalf, it can be done on a voluntary basis. Those who insist that government is necessary often claim that if there wasn't a government, then smaller private gangs would spring up to enslave and rob people. Organized crime gangs exist along with government, and most people do not understand the dynamics between them and how government enriches and empowers organized crime while appearing to fight it. Black markets enrich organized crime, and money allows them to buy government protection. There's no reason to think they would do as well in an environment of freedom 
where they would have fewer ways to make money and would be up against both individual and organized armed citizens. A criminal gang that's recognized as such has far less power than a gang whose aggression is perceived to be legitimate and proper. And that's the gang we call government. When thuggery is called law enforcement, and thievery is called taxation, and self-defense is called crime and terrorism, then even the widespread ownership of firearms can't do much to stop the aggression. Imagine a private gang trying to do the things that government does without the aura of authority, and imagine how a well-armed population would respond to this. The gang would fail quickly and dramatically. Another concern that people have when they first consider the idea of a stateless society is that some people are truly malicious, destructive, and sociopathic. The concern is that these people would be free to do anything they wanted and no one would stop them. But this concern is again based on a basic misunderstanding of human nature. Wherever we have a government ruling class, we still have freelance thieves and thugs who are not deterred by the laws of the politicians. In some instances, they're stopped by force by the police or they decide not to commit a crime for fear of what the police might do to them. What makes this deterrence work is not the legislation or the official badges, but the simple threat of harm to the sociopath. It really makes no difference whether the threat comes from the police or another citizen or even another criminal. A sociopath doesn't care about laws or social rules He cares about avoiding pain and hardship for himself. This is still true when a government ruling class is not involved at all. If the intended target of a would-be carjacker pulls out a gun, it doesn't make any difference to the carjacker whether that person has a badge or whether there's a law against taking people's cars. Discouraging nasty people from hurting others does not require special authority only the ability to use defensive force. Ironically, though people hope that government will protect them, having a government, a gang which is believed to have the right to tax and control people, just creates one gang so big and powerful that normal people can't resist it. In short, to create a huge gang and then give it societal permission to control and extort people with the hope that this gang will prevent theft and thuggery is simply a self-contradictory idea, but that's what government always is. Some people might assume that if people organize for mutual protection and defense, then that's what government is. But there's an essential difference. People coming together to do something that everyone has the right to do, such as defend yourself, doesn't require any special authority. It's not government unless one group of people claims the right to do things which others do not have the right to do, such as taxing and controlling innocent people. Organized defense can be very effective without supposing the special right to rule over others, in other words, without being government. In contrast, Governments rob the people they rule of far more wealth than private crooks could ever manage, making the idea of a protector government ridiculous. All right, there are many, many, many other issues that are raised here and objections that will be raised and countering back and forth, but this entire podcast is not devoted to this one question alone, so I'll leave it there. But of course, I would suggest you watch that full video, which I just uh, played a little clip from, so that you can find out about some of the other objections, the very most common objections to anarchism. Uh, But suffice it to say, no, just because anarchism, free society, does not mean no laws, no rules. It means no rulers. So there is no authority that has some monopoly over violence that can be used to extort you for your money to for protection services, which ensures there are a gang of thugs ruling over you. Um, again, it's not that it's going to be a lollipop and wonderland, but it means that you can actually disengage with protective services that abuse their powers. And that is uh, an exceptionally important thing, not to be underestimated. But 
Obviously, this is a huge topic and needs a lot more fleshing out. For those who would like a more academic um, analysis of this, I would uh, once again recommend previous Corbett Report guest Gary Chartier's book, Anarchy and Legal Order, Law and Politics for a Stateless Society, where you can find a more lengthy and thorough and academic discussion of these types of subjects. But again, thank you for raising the uh, the question, SC Pat, because it's one that a lot of people have, and we'll have to continue talking about it in the future, I'm sure. Uh, let's move on to another corporate report member, this time from uh, the, uh, Hook, who writes... My husband has been researching the legal fiction status of Americans under the Uniform Commercial Code and has recently stumbled upon some publicly recorded documents wherein the filer has made a UCC filing using the capital letter name as the doctor, as the debtor, sorry, and the given name as the secured party. These filings state they are using a number of laws, including admiralty law, as the basis for the filings. Do you have a view about trying to establish control over the legal fiction that has been created for you by the state? Uh, this merges quite well with many, many different email questions that I've received. Um, one of the most recent from someone going by the name Honey, who writes, I read this uh, yellow uh, fringe on the flag, goes back to admiralty law, and that the U.S. law was taken over back in the 1880s by this secret government who has been in charge ever since. What would happen if people insisted on getting rid, rid of the yellow fringed flags, do you think? Is it even possible? Uh, these types of emails I get quite a lot, and I understand, I certainly understand where people are coming from, and it is mind-blowing when you start to look into the legal fictions and the, the web of lies that has been woven around us um, through the courts and by color of law, and by these all these tricks that are played, these legal tricks that clearly are tricks. Uh, and I understand that because I, I've experienced it myself when I was looking into this and going, ah, that's amazing, that's incredible. But I think it so often derails people and gets them into thinking, well, we got to get rid of the special fringe around the flag that is this magical symbol which magically makes this into a maritime admiralty law court which has these certain proceedings. And if it didn't have that, then everything would be better. Or, you know, we have to uh, attack, uh, understand this is the straw man and differentiate ourselves from it. And no, no, you're talking about the person, but I'm not that person and all of that. And it gets into the... It plays the legal game that they want you to play, even though you're playing it on a higher level and you understand, the, oh, they're trying to use this trick, so I'll try to counter with, with this piece of knowledge. But it's still the legal game. It's still a game. And it's a, I mean, I'm not dissuading people if they want to do this. Uh, if you want to be the freeman on the land or the sovereign citizen or whatever and, and do this and make this your battle and your struggle, go for it. Um, if you want to, have this legal mind battle every with every single law enforcement agent, policeman, peace officer, sheriff, bailiff, judge, lawyer, every single person that you interact with in this system, every step of the way, always fighting and, and playing these mind games. And then, unfortunately, sad to say, although I think a lot of people involved in this won't say it, more often than not, getting shut down on those lines of argumentation. If you want to do it, you can, but I'm telling you, it's not its not a quite as easy as some of the people who promote this uh, would like you to believe. I'm no. simply separating myself from the person. They are two different entities, right, and I know the that. The court is not viewing you as two different people. The court is viewing you as well, one not, entity sir? for the purpose of these cases. Then what entity are you referring to me as? I'm because referring, I referring to, referring to me as the as David as Hall, who's the settler, the agent, the individual, and the person. I'm not the person, sir. Okay, I am not the, the person, person, David Hall. Tell him he's not leaving jail either, all right? Now, that's just one tiny little snippet of an example, um, but there are many, 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 many more examples. You don't even have to look very hard to find them of similar situations being played out where the judge or the policeman or whoever it is who is in that position, that seat of authority, they don't play the game. They just say, ah, they just laugh it off. It's a joke to them and they put you behind bars. And those bars are very real. Uh, whether it's your straw man or you as a person, you're behind those bars um, when they when they decide that you are going to do that. So again, I'm not saying that you should just give in and play the legal game that they want you to play rather than the one they don't want you to play. But recognize at any rate that whatever, whichever way you go, you're playing a legal game uh, as opposed to following natural law as interpreted and developed in different localities over time through common law, which is the only law that 
really should matter, but of course it doesn't. I think the more fundamental point of all of this is we have to make that more understood throughout the entire population. It has to be diffused. This has to be common knowledge through the population before it can be used in that way in courts and what have you, because the judges and the juries and the policemen and the every every single person involved in this are themselves part of that greater general population. And if their minds are controlled by this overarching idea they have of what the justice system is and how it functions and what they're doing and what role they're playing, if their minds are caught in that, then, you know, you can argue with them, but they can ultimately say no and throw you behind a cage and throw you in a cage and throw away the key. Um, so, again, I'm not dissuading people from going down that route if they really want to. I'm just saying that's, I don't think it's necessarily the best possible use of your time and resources. And I don't, I don't put... I, my ultimate goal isn't to remove a yellow fringe around a flag. My ultimate goal is to get people to see that that kind of nonsense and trickery is just nonsense and trickery and see through it rather than to fight that, that thing as if that is what is important, if you understand what I'm saying. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, this time, another audio question through the SpeakPipe application on the contact form of CorbettReport.com from Dodie. Hello, James. My question is on population. Uh, everyone keeps saying we're overpopulated, but yet I was thinking that we've hit our peak because in order for the population to increase, every woman must have at least two children, uh, one for to replace herself and one to replace the husband. And it used to be that families had very large families so that I could see the increase. But anymore, uh, most families are having no children at all or one child. So is this panic over overpopulation going in the wrong direction? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Dodi. The simple answer is yes. Um, yes, absolutely. Even the UN's own data uh, on population growth estimates show that the curve is flattening and will level off somewhere around 11 billion. It depends on their estimate. It goes from 9 to whatever it is, 12. But at any rate, somewhere in there uh, by the end of the century. And that includes the ever-increasing life expectancy, which is meaning people will live longer and longer, thus there will be more and more elderly people in society. In fact, there will be a greater proportion of elderly people. There probably is at this point, but at any rate, there will be even more so by the end of the century than has ever existed in human history. Not just the number of elderly people, but the proportion of that to the overall global population. So even though people are living longer and there are more there, there's going to be more elderly people at the sort of top of that age pyramid. Um, even with that into account, the growth is slowing and is leveling off towards the end of the century, even by the UN's own doctored estimates. So to put it in perspective, I, again, demography is something that's difficult because it's slightly counterintuitive, so people don't think of it. It... Uh, oh, just because it is increasing at this point does not mean that the, it's out of control increasing. And the fact that it's on, that the acceleration is decreasing means that it, it is not the, the, the type of problem that people have in their heads. So that to put that in perspective, in the 20th century, the global population increased by 400%, a factor of four. That's a significant number of people that were added to the population. In the entire 21st century, the projection is an additional 50%. It will grow by 50%. So that gives you a sense of how, how much and how quickly it is leveling off. And, uh, and people will point to the varying dem demographics in different, the varying fertility rates in different areas and saying, well, yes, in, in Asia, for example, where I am, certainly in Japan, fertility rates are extremely low, but in other countries, they're extremely, they're still extremely high in Africa and other places. Well, even in developing countries, and even in places like Africa, the fertility rates are still, are not increasing in the way that they were, and are in fact going down. Um, so it really is across the board, pretty much. Now, that, what that means is that ultimately this, uh, this overpopulation hysteria, which has been drilled into the population generally, uh, uh, to the point where it, it is difficult to find anyone in casual conversation that you engage in that will question any of it, 
there is, it's almost taken as gospel truth that we are overpopulated, that there's too many people, we've got to get rid of a lot of people. I just want, even if you believe that, even if you believe that in your heart of hearts, I just want you to think for a moment about how many issues there are like that, where where people are just, there's not even a discussion about it, no question about it. Anyone that you broach the subject to will say, yes, there's too many people. We got to get rid of them. We got to kill. We want to see blood in the streets. Maybe they don't put it that way, but that is, that is always the dark shadow of this topic. And you might want to question, how has that been so thoroughly drilled into the population where on a- any other political issue you can think of, there's always two sides and maybe some one is more stronger and one is weaker at any given time, but there's always, you can always find contrary opinions, but not on the overpopulation issue. That's an interesting part. And ultimately this does go back to eugenics and it does go back to Malthus uh, at the very least. There's other philosophical antecedents to this and there's other progenitors and other branches of this uh, philosophy that are important to study, but a lot of it does center around Malthus, and explicitly so when you find out that the uh, the Birth Control League, for example, was originally kicking around with neo-Malthusianism and flirting with the ideas that Malthus originally promoted that not only do we not want to help the poor, we actually want to foster the idea of well, poor people should live not just in slums, but in literal marshlands or swamps or bogs, as Malthus wrote about, so that they would contract diseases. This is literally his idea, because well, we don't want to be kind to the poor because that would be horrible because then there'd be more people. Um, this is, uh, it's important to understand that this this philosophy was part of the, well, certainly the eugenics movement glommed onto it um, because it happily fitted directly into what they were talking about. And again, we don't have to go out on a limb on that. John D. Rockefeller III, no surprise there, literally created the Population Council out of the offices and officers of the American Eugenics Society. It was the same offices. It was the same people. They just switched the name on the door, pretty much, from American Eugenics Society to Population Council. And now, it, oh, we don't talk about eugenics anymore. We're talking about population, population control. Oh, that sounds a bit harsh, doesn't it? Okay, so we're going to solve the overpopulation problem. Oh, that sounds nicer, doesn't it? Um, so this is an extremely important subject. Uh, I, and it's difficult. Again, it's one of those that, uh, that nobody really wants to hear. Even in the alt media, people don't want to hear this type of thing. Um, it's like the oil companies are behind the Paris Climate Agreement. Exxon and Shell are there shilling for the Paris Climate Agreement. Does that not make you question the, the paradigm that you've been told about what this... Oh, no, no, no one wants to hear about that. And in this case, again, no one wants to hear that uh, the, the population is totally out of control and will, you know billions will have to perish. Um, but for people who are interested in exploring this idea, I'll put in a link to an essay that I wrote a few years ago, um, uh, Demographic Winter. And uh, I would suggest, if you haven't watched it yet, that you watch my last word on overpopulation. Malthus himself, an Anglican minister, wrote that we are bound in justice and honor formally to disdain the right of the poor to support, arguing for a law making it illegal for the Anglican Church to give any food, clothing, or support to any children. Not content with consigning thousands of children to death for the misfortune of being born poor, however, Malthus also advocated actively contributing to the deaths of more of the poor through social engineering. Instead of recommending cleanliness to the poor, we should encourage contrary habits. In our towns, we should make the streets narrower, crowd more people into the houses, and court the return of the plague. In the country, we should build our villages near stagnant pools, and particularly encourage settlement on all marshy and unwholesome situations. But above all, we should reprobate scientific remedies for ravaging diseases, and restrain those benevolent but much mistaken men who have thought that they are doing a service to mankind by protecting schemes for the total extirpation of particular disorders. The horrific nature of this idea is made all the more preposterous by the fact that Malthus was encouraging the spread of disease and plague in order to save humanity from the diseases and plagues that overpopulation fosters. But this self-contradiction is completely lost on those whose bloodlust drives them to support such drastic population reduction schemes to kill off the poor and downtrodden of society. As repulsive as Malthus's ideas are to our sensibilities, they have provided an ideological framework for those with a psychopathic urge to dominate others for the past 200 years. In his infamous 1968 book The Population Bomb, Paul Ehrlich and his wife Anne wrote, 
A cancer is an uncontrolled multiplication of cells. The population explosion is an uncontrolled multiplication of people. We must shift our efforts from the treatment of the symptoms to the cutting out of the cancer. The operation will demand many apparently brutal and heartless decisions. He felt the cancer of newborn babies was so potentially devastating to humanity that in 1969 he actually advocated adding sterilants to the food and water supply. Lest there were any doubt about his remarks, he further elaborated on them in Ecoscience, a 1977 book that he co-authored with Obama's current science czar, John Holdren, where they once again advocated adding sterilants to the water supply. In 1972, ex-World Bank advisor and UN functionary Maurice Strong advocated government licensing for women's right to have children. In 1988, Prince Philip uttered his deplorable comment, In the event I am reborn, I would like to return as a deadly virus in order to contribute something to solve overpopulation. In the 1990s, Ted Turner told Audubon magazine that a total world population of 250 to 300 million people, a 95% decline from present levels, would be ideal. Of course, the overpopulation myth itself crumbles under the slightest scrutiny. No one, not even the UN, is projecting limitless growth of the human population. Even the most alarmist predictions show the world population leveling off within 40 years. What's more, the birth rate in every major industrialized nation in the world is now below the replacement rate of 2.1, meaning that they are in fact dying nations of aging populations that require an ever-increasing influx of immigrants just to maintain their population level. In addition to the well-known phenomenon of industrialization reducing the size of families, there are now indications that chemicals called endocrine disruptors, which are mysteriously ending up in our foods, plastics, and drinking water, are limiting our biological ability to reproduce, with sperm rates among Western men declining a staggering 50% in the last 50 years, with 85% of the remaining sperm being abnormal. But still, even if we were to take the hysteria over population size at face value, the solutions suggested by the Malthusians, forced sterilization programs, deindustrializations, and even genocide, represent the biggest fraud of all. The idea that merely reducing the size of a population will somehow reduce the inequalities and iniquities within that society. As Mencken famously observed, the urge to save humanity is almost always a false front for the urge to rule over it. And the only thing that I could add to that is that sometimes it's an urge for uh, a mask for the urge to destroy it altogether. Anyway, lots more to be said there. I hope you will check out that full video um, rather than the clip that we just watched for the greater context. But uh, yes, uh, to answer your question, Dodie, the overpopulation hype has gone is in completely the wrong direction. Um, finally, uh, again, since we're running out of time here, it's getting late in the evening as I'm recording this. Uh, we'll turn the questions around to the question for you that I often end this podcast with um, to see what your guys' take on this is. Again, we'll turn back to Twitter for at real poo poo smith. <laughs> Not to be confused with that fake poo poo smith who's going around, I guess. Uh, at real poo poo smith has this Q for C. Please name an assassin or terrorist who absolutely was definitely not connected to government or industry and acted on their own. I think there are examples of that, but certainly not the popular examples, not the everyday names that we've been drilled with. So I, I have some names that I guess I could throw out there, but I, I'd like to see what you guys come up with. Are there any big name assassin terrorists, you know, the headline makers that, have not been connected in any way with any government agency or yeah, alphabet soup agency or industry and acted completely on their own. They're genuine lone nuts. Interesting. Um, certainly not ones that get a lot of press, I think. But I'd like to see what you guys think out there on that question. Once again, uh, lots of different ways to get your questions in. And once again, if I didn't get to yours, please don't take it personally. I'm going to reset the uh, reset the question clock. Is that a mixed metaphor? I don't think that makes any sense. So I'm going to reset the board and we'll do it all over again in a month or so. I hope you'll join me for that. James Corbett, CorbettReport.com. The Corbett Report is brought to you by you. Your support makes The Corbett Report possible. Sign up for the subscriber newsletter or purchase a DVD at CorbettReport.com support.